Amen. So we're continuing in Acts part two. We're going to be in chapter 15 this morning. If you want to go ahead and flip there or scroll there on your phone, whatever you're going to do. There's a lot to talk about today. This is a massive moment in the book of Acts, a massive moment in our history as the church. A lot of cool things we're going to talk about. And just before we jump in, I want to bring up a few concepts or ideas that we've been talking about as a church quite a bit over the last few months. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Each of these is going to come up throughout the message, and so I just want to remind you of some ideas. The first thing that we've been talking about recently together as a church is that God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. We've talked about, of course, it is by grace through faith that we are saved. It's not about works. It's not about what we do that gets us saved, but we enter into, once we're saved and we, we give ourselves to Jesus and he's Lord, we enter into a real relationship with him where there's things that he does and there's things that then we are expected to do. There's ways that we're expected to follow and things that we are supposed to do and change about ourselves as we follow Jesus. And so God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. Another thing we've talked about a lot recently, particularly in this book, the book of Acts, is this idea called prescriptive versus descriptive. That there are things in, particularly when you have a, a big book like Acts that's telling this massive historical story, that there are moments where it's descriptive. It's describing what's happening. and doesn't necessarily ask us to or want us to emulate every piece of it exactly as we're reading it, but it's describing what's in the story. And then there are moments that are prescriptive where it's saying you should do this. This is something for the church in the future. This is something for all of us to implement in our lives. And so we have to be careful and look as we're reading uh, these stories and reading these books of the Bible, kind of how we're supposed to interpret each moment um, on its own. And the third thing to, to just bring up and remind us of this morning, Pastor Ricky a few weeks ago did the message where Peter receives a vision with all the food coming down on the blanket. The Gentiles are invited into the faith. And the point of that message was this really great idea of don't build um, unnecessary barriers for people as they're coming to Jesus. Amen. We don't want to build unnecessary difficulties and hardships for people as they are coming into the faith. We need to be careful about what we're asking people, what walls we are putting up. And each of these ideas is going to come up this morning. So I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page there. And then a little bit of background just that gets us to chapter 15. There's been so much happening um, in the story. Paul and Barnabas are some uh, key uh, characters for us as they are going to the Gentiles. This massive thing has happened. Uh, the Holy Spirit has um, fallen on Gentile believers. It's a big deal. There's all of these new people coming to faith. And we're navigating as the church um, in this time, what do we do with that? How do we work together? How do we come together? What does all this look like? And so that's kind of the background sort of moment that we find ourselves in here in Acts chapter 15. So we're going to start reading this morning, Acts 15, verses 1 and 2. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. So we see there's these, these guys, uh, and they just take it on themselves. They're just called some guys, you know. There's just some men. They're not official. They're not sent by anyone. But they were just sitting around one day and decided, I think it would be good if we go to all these brand new believers and tell them they have to be circumcised and they have to live their life according to the law of Moses. And that's what they come and they tell all these new Gentile believers. They've got to do it just like this. And one of my top five favorite words is vehemently. And so that's in there, which I just find to be a perk. Um, but Paul and Barnabas are upset by this and they argue about this. That's not Right, and we, that's the moment that's kind of happening here. And if you want to read more about Paul arguing vehemently, you can read Galatians, because it's about this whole idea, about adding some of these unnecessary barriers for believers, particularly regarding circumcision. So that's what's happening. These guys have come. Um, wonderful things happening in the church at Antioch. People believing. These guys show up, and they kind of create a bit of a, a stir. And now these people are confused. They have questions. What is it exactly that we need to do? Are these guys right? Are Paul and Barnabas right? What do we need to do? Because these guys have shown up and said, it's great that you believe in Jesus. That's awesome. But you have to do this and this and this to actually be saved. Yeah. So it's not enough to just believe, but you have to also live your life in these ways. And then that's how you are actually 
saved. And so the, the kind of the way I think about this is like this water has been heating up for a while and now it's boiling. It's at the spot where it's like, okay, what do we do with these questions? How are we going to move forward as the church? And so the church at Antioch sends Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem and they have this massive meeting that's called the Jerusalem Council. And it's a huge deal in the history of uh, Christianity. It's a huge deal for us. It's this massive moment where kind of we are officially coming together to decide how we're going to move forward as the church. What are we going to do about these two groups of people that have grown up completely different from each other, but now we're all here together. How are we going to handle this? So they're at the church HQ in Jerusalem. They're going to figure this out and have this massive meeting. That's where we're going to continue to pick this up. Acts 15 verses four and five. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So Paul and Barnabas give testimony. There's all these beautiful things God has been doing. Here's how the church is growing. Here's how lives are being changed and impacted. And then in, in the midst of that sort of moment, these group of people belonging to the sect of the Pharisees. So I hear the dun, dun, dun music because it's like, they're always just the worst people, you know? The Pharisees are always just like causing trouble. And they stand up in the middle of this meeting and they're like, listen, they need to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses if they actually want to be saved. And so that's, again, we're, we're in that argument. What do we do to be saved? And Paul and Barnabas are going to argue this and Peter's going to argue this. And there's a lot of really key moments happening that are coming up here, but they, they, they chime in and say, you need to follow the laws of Moses, including circumcision to actually be saved. And I think there's three sort of things happening in this moment that I want to pull out from the story. Just again, not, I don't want to just read over it, but I really want to try to pull some things into our life to think about. I think there's three things going on and I've got them here. Number one, I think what's happening is what they're saying is this is how it's always been done, right? Like this is what we've always done. And so it just feels right to keep doing that, right? And so tradition is a beautiful, wonderful thing. And I love tradition. And I love these beautiful things that are built into our faith. But when you hold tradition above um, its intended place, that's where things get a little broken. Amen. And that's what's happening here. They're saying, I think this is just what we've always done. So it makes sense to us that they have to do that as well. And I think the layer underneath that is, this is what we had to do. So we had to do all this stuff and obey all these laws and walk this out very carefully. That's what we had to do. And so I think they should have to do that. Does anybody in the room have a younger sibling? Show of hands. Okay. Chuckles, because you know where I'm going here. I have a younger brother. When I was growing up, there were rules, okay? And I had to do certain things. And you have to be home by this time. You can't watch these movies. You can't listen to this. Like, these are the rules, okay? And I had to do all those things. And then my younger brother was born, and he could do whatever he wanted forever. There's just like, there's no, you can well, stay out as late as you want. You want to watch that? That's fine. You want to listen to this? I'm like, wait a minute. When I was growing up, there were certain, you know, there was a, a way that we had to do this, and it feels like that standard's not being held over here. And you get upset, and you think, man, this doesn't seem fair. I think what's happening here is a little bit of that, like, I had to do all this stuff, but they don't have to. And, I, and that makes me a little upset. That starts to mess with me. And I think that bottom, that third one there is kind of what the real thing is. It's not fair that they don't have to do it. They can just believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes to them just like it did to us, but it feels like we had to do all this other stuff and they didn't. It's not fair that they don't have to do it. And there's a, there's a parable that Jesus um, teaches and I was kind of reading this story. I, I was reminded of it and it's not gonna be on your screens. I'm just gonna kind of walk through what Jesus teaches and he says, so imagine there's this uh, guy and he owns this field and he needs people to come work in the field. And he goes out early in the morning and he gets a couple guys and he agrees with them. You know, at the end of the day, I'm going to pay you $100, we'll say. Pay you $100 uh, to come work in the field. And so they start working. It's early in the morning. The owner of the field goes out again, sort of midday, grabs some more people. Hey, come work for me. Um, and then by the end of the day, there's only a few hours of work left even and he, he hires a few more guys, come work for me. And then at the end of the day, when he's paying them, he starts with the guys that just got there and he goes through each one and he pays each one $100. So what the guys that were, you know, the very beginning of the day, what they were told they were gonna get, everybody gets that. And they're upset. They're like, wait a minute. 
We've been here all day doing all this stuff, but they get the same thing that we get. And Jesus is really, I think, pulling out some of this exact idea that's happening here, that there's this something inside of us that kind of flares up. And I think it's an indicator of how much we're thinking about ourselves. Like, wait a minute, I had to do all this, so I think everybody should have to do all this. And it doesn't seem fair or right to me that they're going to get the same thing I got, even though I had to be here all day. And I think what Jesus is pulling out is we're so, we're so focused on ourselves, how it feels to us, the inner sense of fairness that I might have about me. And I'm not even thinking about what it is that God's doing. I'm not thinking about how he's blessing other people. I'm not rejoicing in the work that God's doing around me because I'm so focused on myself. And so these Pharisees are standing up and I think what's happening is we had to do all this stuff. It's not fair that they don't have to. So we want them to do all of this as well if they're gonna actually be saved. And so we're gonna look at Peter's response here. Peter stands up in this moment again. He's a big deal in the church, carries a ton of weight and his influence is big. And he's gonna give one of his great moments. Peter's got some awful moments for sure, but he's got some total gold, wonderful moments. And this is certainly one of them as he stands up in the midst of this big discussion and argument. So Acts 15, starting at verse seven. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Amen. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. Verse 10, this is really important. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. This is a huge moment. And I don't want to like, uh, like give it more importance than it has, but it's just a massive moment. I think this is, this is one of the line in the sand moments where Peter stands up and he's saying, guys, this is a whole new thing, actually, that we're doing. Jesus has come, and what he's done is it's changed the game. And I know there were all these things that we did, but Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And he died on the cross for us. And actually, the only thing that saves us is that. And this is, this is an, a whole new idea. And he says this great line, it's the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. It is by grace that we are saved. And I want us to pause here and we're going to explore more of what, G, or what, what I think Peter is getting at. But I want to also um, ask ourselves that question because this is such a key moment for us as a church to think about this. That this is, this is kind of where we came from, I think, was this discussion. Hey, it's actually not all of this other stuff. It is about the grace of Jesus. It's a recognition that a whole new thing is happening. So there's a number of questions kind of happening here. Um, that are being answered or at least being asked. The first one obviously is, okay, what saves us? That's what they're getting at. They're, they're, they're in this big discussion, what is it that actually saves us? Does it have anything to do with Old Testament law? Does it have anything to do with following these set of rules or is it just Jesus? And Peter answers definitively in this moment, it's Jesus. It is Jesus on the cross that saves us. And he says this really great line, and it's really important. He says, neither us nor our ancestors could actually do this anyway. So why are we trying to make them do it? And that's a really big moment. I think it goes back to that idea of, I had to do this, and so I think you should have to do this. I had to go through all this, and I had to struggle with all of these things. And so it feels right to me, fair to me, that you would also have to struggle with those same things. There's something happening here in their hearts, I think, that's really revealing. And I think I recognize myself in it quite a lot. That I, if I've gone through something, I want others to go through it because that just kind of feels right to me. And when you see somebody that didn't go through that, you're like, oh man, they don't even know. There's something that happens in us. And I remember um, it was right when Sarah and I, we were about to get married. We were at Bible college, um, a, few, you know, a few months away from getting married. And the advice that we got from like everyone was, um, the first year of marriage is the hardest. First year of marriage is the hardest. That's what everybody always told us. So it's the only thing that we heard. And I remember um, there was a guy named Lee Burns and he was the, uh, like the vice president of the college that we were at. 
and he knew us and we were about to get married and he pulled us aside one day. And I don't know if he knew that that's what people had been saying, but he just grabbed us and said, everybody um, always says the first year of marriage is the hardest, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. You, you guys get to come into this thing and it's you two working together. And so it doesn't have to be the hardest year of your marriage. And there was something about that simple, like everybody says this, but it doesn't have to be true for you. And I think what he was getting at and what he was trying to explain to us is a lot of people, their first year of marriage maybe was the hardest. And so they want it to be the hardest for you. That's kind of what's happening. It's this, we're not even doing it on purpose, but I think it's part of the selfishness that exists within us. This was tough for me. So I want it to be tough for you. So I'm telling you, your first year of marriage is going to be the hardest. It wasn't the easiest year of our marriage, but we, we went into it, I think, with that kind of freedom of this doesn't have to be how this is going to go. There's, there's something happening in this story that I think is really important for us. The, the way that we talk about things, the burdens that we lay on people, the weight that we lay on people, we need to be careful about that. I think it happens in the church quite a bit because I was thinking this last week, like the number of um, times that I've been in churches and listening to messages or pastors conferences or whatever, and somebody gets up and says something like, all men struggle with this. All women need that. All teens need to hear this. Every teen struggles with blank. And there's something about that that you just go, I think maybe this guy struggled with it. And so he wants everybody to. And there's something I think a little bit dangerous that we need to be careful of when somebody goes, everybody needs this. Every person struggles with that. Every, there's something about that I think we need to be careful of because we need to care, be careful about what burdens we're laying on other people. Amen. They want people to go through some of the same things that they went through, but actually Jesus is doing something different. So be careful about what you lay on other people. So at this point, another character in the story stands up, James. He's the brother of Jesus one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. And he, what he does is he pulls out an Old Testament prophecy just to remind the room that this isn't a new idea. This isn't something that just kind of crept up and now we've got to figure out what to do, but this has been God's plan all along. God has always intended to do this, to bring the Gentiles into the faith. And so he's going to quote a verse from the book of Amos, which is a prophet in the Old Testament. And this is what he says in Acts 15, starting in verse 16. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. So he's quoting Amos chapter 9, 11 and 12 there. So he's saying, again, remember, this has always been God's plan. And we're sitting here over here and we're trying to figure out what to do. And we're sort of shocked by this. And that, I think, is a, another indicator that we've made this about ourselves. And so we're, we're freaking out about us rather than rejoicing in what God has been doing in the lives of these other people. And so that's the, the, the verse that he quotes. And then he, what he's going to go into now is he's going to actually start to dive into the complications of having a massive church family that is very different. So all of that's true. We're saved by grace. We're not going to lay unnecessary burdens on people. But now, how do we actually walk forward? What are, the, what are we going to do to actually promote that unity? How are we going to actually love each other? What is this going to look like? There's a lot of nuance in this part of the conversation, a lot of things that James is going to bring up that we're going to have to dive into. Um, but I, just, I was thinking about it because I just had a family reunion with my side of the family just a couple weeks ago. And there, there are uh, people in my family that are on opposite ends of everything you can think of. And so the whole time, you're just waiting for somebody to say Trump. You're like, oh, no. Or somebody to say Biden. You're, ah. Or somebody to say Israel. Like, ah. You know, you're just like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a firework and explode. And, you know, like that, that whole time, but we're also all trying to figure out how are we going to be a family? Like, how are we going to actually navigate these things together? How are we going to come together and love each other because we are family? That's what they're going to have to get into now, okay? We've established some of these uh, foundational truths. What saves us? Jesus. Does the, does the law save us? No, it doesn't. Jesus saves us. But how are we now going together, together walk forward as a family? And so here's what he's going to say um, in Acts 15, 19 through 21. And so my judgment, again, this is James talking, is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, from consuming blood. For, the law, for these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. 
And so he's saying, we're not gonna make it too difficult. We're not gonna put unnecessary barriers. However, there are things that we can tell them that are gonna make this easier for everyone. Because there are certain things that every single Sunday as Jewish people gather together, every single time they meet, they're being told these things. This is like the heart of the law, as one uh, uh, pastor said it that I watched this last week, this idea of it all revolves around idolatry, how we eat what we eat, and then sexual immorality. That's everything boiled down kind of fits into some of these categories. And so he's saying it's so, this is such a foundational thing for so many, all of the Jewish believers that as we invite these people in, we're not gonna make it difficult. However, we're gonna work together. This is a relationship. We're gonna ask them to do or to not do some things. And we're gonna get into why all of that in just a second. But I wanna read the letter that they write them. So again, you've got all these Gentile believers that have asked these questions and this is the official letter that they get back explaining to them what's gonna happen. So this, uh, Acts 15, 24 through 28. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching. But we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judas and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating foods offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well, farewell. There's something about the end of that letter that always makes me laugh. They're like, if you do these things, that's great, you know, and then we'll see you guys later. I don't know, it's something funny about the farewell. Um, but they, they write this letter. We're not gonna lay any of these unnecessary things on you. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to follow every single one of these things. However, we're gonna encourage you to do some of these things or to stop doing some of these things. Things. So here's the, the restrictions that are given to the Gentile believers. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't eat meat that's been strangled or has blood in it. And then don't uh, stay away from sexual immorality. So those are the, the, the restrictions that are given. And we're going to get into, I think, why these are the things that are said to them. But I think it's really interesting that this is what's been asked of them. And I, I was kind of asking myself the question, if, if in modern times, what would we say to a group of new people? Here's some really key things. And I don't know if it would be these, and I'm challenged by that. Like, what would I say? Be like, okay, make sure you serve. Make sure you give. I don't know. Make sure you're reading your Bible. I, I'm not sure what I would say, but these are, these are challenging to me as I read them. And so I want to exp explore, I think, why these are the things that are said to these new Gentile believers. And, and James says, these are laws, these are things that have been practiced and taught every single Sabbath in all the synagogues for a long, long time. And so there's obviously, um, for some of these things, this is where we're going to get into our prescriptive, descriptive part of the message. He, he lays out some Jewish cultural restrictions regarding food. And there's so many reasons why throughout Old Testament that Jewish people were encouraged to and required to do the things that they did. And as they were navigating all of this life, this is what they continued to do. They continued to eat things in, in, in a way that was laid out for them and had all of these structures. But um, Paul later, actually, in the New Testament, Corinthians, he kind of brings some clarification to some of this, to this idea of eating meat, sacrifice to idols, and all of that. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, this is what Paul writes. Now, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols... Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all of the answers doesn't really know very much, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Amen. And so he gets into, after that, he gets into the knowledge he's talking about is we know it doesn't matter uh, what you eat. It doesn't matter where the meat was sacrificed or what happened to the meat. We know that. It doesn't matter. However, that knowledge is less important than you loving each other. So it's one thing to know, oh, this isn't a big deal, but it's a whole better thing to go, this might not be a big deal, but to the people around me, my Jewish brothers and sisters in this context, that are um, living life according to this way, it's better for me to just maybe not say anything, but love them and do, what, do what's happening here. 
And there's a lot of nuance in that. And we can't break down every single variable that happens in there, but I think there's a principle that happens in this letter that says, hey, we're gonna promote unity. We're gonna work together. This is gonna be a family. And one of the things that's gonna make this so much easier is if you do this. Knowledge is one thing, but loving each other is more important. Amen. And these first three things is all just about food and how it's prepared. And then the, the, the last one though, the sexual immorality, that's not a Jewish cultural thing. That's not something Paul ever writes in a later letter to clarify what that means. That's just, what I, what I would say this is, is it's the Jewish believers inviting Gentile believers into a new ethic, a new idea about the importance of the human body. I would say Christianity has a high view of the body. And this is a really important thing. And again, I was challenged by, okay, why is that one of the things that they said in this letter? Hey, make sure you abstain from sexual immorality. I think it's the invitation and the teaching of your body has tremendous value. And that's actually one of the core principles of what it means to follow Jesus is to recognize that your body has value and what you do with it what you eat, how you eat, and who you sleep with matters. There's actually a lot of importance in that as you follow Jesus. And so descriptive, prescriptive, do you and I have to worry about where our food was sacrificed to? We don't have to worry about that, okay? And I would say if you're eating steak right, there is blood in it a little bit, okay? That's the way it should be done, okay? Do we have to worry about that? No, these are, these are Jewish cultural restrictions but underneath that, is there a heart that we should grasp that says, hey, um, maybe think about, care about, and love each other in a way that you maybe ask yourselves, even if I know something, should I love? Do I have to say this? Do I have to tell them that I don't think that's a big deal? Do I have to say that every single time? Or should I instead choose love, which strengthens the church? So two ideas that I want us to kind of land the plane on. The first idea is just that care about each other and help each other follow Jesus. Care about each other and help each other follow Jesus. Asking ourselves the question, what's helpful? What can I do or not do that is gonna be helpful when we are gathered here together like this? What things could I bring up or not bring up that are gonna promote unity together? It's one thing to have knowledge about something, but that's less important than loving each other. Amen. So love each other, help each other. Do I always have to say this thing when it comes up? Do I always have to make my point about this? I think what we're being called to in this letter and in that passage by Paul in 1 Corinthians is choose love sometimes. Make sure you're promoting strength together as the body of Christ. Care about each other. I think this means letting go of your pride a little bit. Letting go of sometimes I think the need to always like make my point about something, but instead just choose to love each other in the moment. And the silly example is like, and I got, I got you know, made fun of for this at the end of first service, but I'll still say it here. Like, I don't care if the bed gets made. I'm just gonna say it, okay? In my house. If it's just a pile of sheets on the bed, I'm happy to fall asleep right on top of it, okay? That's fine. Sarah likes the bed to be made. And so we are a family and we love each other and neither of us makes it a big deal to the other person. So we just help each other. And when she's like, hey, can we make the bed? We make the bed. And there's days where we forget about it. The bed's not made. And she's not like, what the heck? You know, because we love each other and we're helping each other. And it's a silly thing, but it's like one of us thinks this, one of us thinks that. Just love each other and help each other and work together. And like, I have this weird thing with my shirts. Like, I don't like my shirts to go in the dryer. I like to hang them up. And I don't know why. There's no reason at all, I don't think, to do that. But I've just decided for whatever reason that that's how I like to do it. And so when Sarah's pulling some of the stuff out of the laundry, she always just hangs my shirts up. Even though it's like probably a, a pain in the butt, you know? But we, did, we love each other. And so there's things that's like, oh, I might think this or I might think that. But you know what? At the end of the day, um, we're going to let it go because we want to be strong together as a family. God wants us to be strong together as a family. And I think there's, there's absolute truth in, he says, the, the way that people will know you're my disciples is about how you love each other. Not just how you love in general, but specifically the way that you, the church, love each other is how they will know. And I think one of the ways that we love each other is we do this. 
we, we say, okay, even, even though I might have this thought, I might have this opinion, I might know this thing, I will choose to just not worry about it and actually just love you as a church family. And let go of our pride and let go of our need to always say something. If that, for, for, for me included, there's like this impulse, like, but I wanna be right though. And I want them to know that I know, you know? And I've gotta let go of that and just trust that God's actually going to do the work that he's gonna do in all of us. So care about each other and help each other to follow Jesus. And then I think the other core idea actually in this passage that I've been wrestling with and thinking about all week long is I think what this passage is teaching us is the high view that Christianity has on the body, your body, and what you do with it. And this can be one of those challenging conversations, but I really want to dive into it because I think it's actually such a beautiful, good thing for us to talk about. One of the key ideas in scripture about who we are, I think, is that we are not just a body and we are not just a soul, but we are both. We are a body and a soul. That's how God designed it to be. So I want us to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is the account where God is creating human beings. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So only after God creates a physical person and then breathes life into it, soul, that's when it becomes a person, a living person, is when both things happen. This is before sin has entered the picture, always God's design about who we would be as human beings is a physical body and a soul. And what I think we're being taught in this passage and what the Gentile believers are being invited into is they affect each other. And what you do with your body affects your soul and vice versa. And one of the things that Paul is going to continually get um, kind of run into as he's writing these letters in your New Testament is this exact idea, particularly in the book of First and Second Corinthians You've got a whole group of people, Gentiles, that have grown up a certain way and had any number of sexual practices in their religion, in their lifestyle, all of the above. And he's got to come and bring some restraint to it. And he's got to come and actually encourage them to and invite them into something else. And I think all of that boils down to it matters what you do with your body because you are a whole person and you are a connected person, your soul and your body. And I think when you start to get that, so many other things start to make sense in scripture. Why does God care if I maybe eat or don't eat this? Because you're a whole person. Why does God want me to fast? Like what, could, what, what possible benefit could there be to my soul just to, to not eat something? Until you realize you're a connected person and what you do in your physical body affects your soul. So why is it a big deal to sleep with whoever? Why is it a big deal to watch porn? Why is it a big deal? Why are we being encouraged in this to abstain from sexual immorality because we are a whole person? I think it's an invitation from these Jewish believers to a brand new group of people that says, watch what happens when you make the choice to physically uh, step away from something, how that's gonna affect your soul, how that's gonna help you follow Jesus. And it might not make sense to you in this moment. I'm sure they didn't like it, I'm sure they weren't pumped that that was one of the things. But I think they're saying, watch what happens. It's a big deal. And as you follow Jesus, if you also realize that there's an incredible value and importance on your physical body and what you do with it and how you use it, and if you use it according to the design that God has for it, watch how that helps you. Watch how that impacts your soul. And I, I definitely want to tread carefully here because I also don't want to do what I've just talked about, which is adding unnecessary guilt or shame onto anybody. Because I think God is a God of transformation and grace and renewal and all these wonderful things. And so all that to say, I think what's happening is an invitation from the Holy Spirit into the way God designed life to be, including your physical body and the way that it's designed to be used and how God will show up and how you will see yourself transformed if you follow the way God has for you. And so here's how I want to end this, the message uh, this morning. This message is titled, I'll tell you at the end, um, One Big Messy Family. Because that's, that's who we are, okay? There's so many different thoughts and opinions and things and backgrounds represented in this room, here and watching online, all over the place. There's all sorts of different things, but we are called together to be a family and to love each other and to strengthen each other. 
And that means a lot of things. And so I wonder sometimes, you know, we're reading these stories about these massive meetings. How do we move together as a church? How do we make sure we're promoting unity and strength? How do we make sure we're doing that? We need to think about those things too. How are we helping each other? How am I helping you? How am I choosing love over what I know? How am I going to do that? And we just did, you know, over Easter that his name is Jesus. I'm wearing the hat this morning. There's people wearing the shirts all over the place still. It's awesome. But we did this thing, his name is Jesus. And that's what we did. I think obviously through God guiding us is he's like, okay, there's all these churches that I'm sure if you sit us all down, we're gonna go, well, we don't think that, or that's not how we do it. But all of that stuff, we said, okay, it doesn't matter what we know, we're gonna choose love. Amen. And we're gonna watch how God strengthens the body of Christ. And we sat together with all those pastors after Easter and each one of them said, how many more people came to their Easter service? How many more people accepted Jesus? How many more people were baptized? All of this growth, why? Because we chose to love each other Amen. over what we knew. Okay, well, I don't think we should do church like this, so I don't think we're gonna partner with them, no. Like we're gonna choose love and watch how God used that moment. I want that to be true for us. Watch as Grace Fellowship gets strengthened. Watch as Grace Fellowship looks more and more like Jesus because we choose to love and help each other and walk in the restrictions that maybe God has for us. How can I help you? That should be the prayer and the question that we're asking ourselves. I invite you all to stand. We're gonna pray together. Jesus, we love you. And God, we're so grateful for, God, the path that you've called us to. God, I thank you that you um, are not just sitting up in heaven somewhere and you're, you're uninterested in what we're doing. God, you're so involved. And there's so many things you want for us, God, because it'll help us to follow you. It'll strengthen us together. God, we'll be a more effective witness to who you are as we follow you. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray uh, a, a couple things. God, help us to love each other well. Help us to choose love. Help us to, God, navigate the difficulties of our modern world. And God, help us to know when to say something, when to not say something. Help us to know, God, how to enter into these conversations because we are a family that needs to love each other and build each other up. God, we choose, God, to let, let go of our own groups and pick up being brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. That's what's more important. That is the defining thing about me, not whatever else. God, help us, help us to, to be brothers and sisters in Christ, to be a family to strengthen each other. And God, help us to walk as we do that into the way that you've called us to live. God, you do have good plans for us. God, you do have good things for us. And God, I think there's so much blessing when we walk in the way that you've designed life to be. And so help us, God, to let go of our own thoughts about some things and choose to trust you with what we do. Choose to trust you with who we are. And God, I think what's gonna happen when we do that is we're gonna watch how our soul is changed and impacted by following you and living life the way that you've designed it to be lived. God, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.